Chapter 3 North had finished his shave when the sheriff again hammered on the door. Where's the other gink? Pat demanded, easing aside. For a moment, the tall young railroader hesitated. Must be downtown, I guess, he replied casually. Too casually. Bunk down here last night? North was obviously at a loss. No, he admitted reluctantly. How come? Oh, he has friends in town and often spends the night with them. It was plainly apparent to the cloaked watching sheriff that North was ill at ease. Quit covering up, he snapped. You're acquainted with those friends? I am not, replied the other with emphasis. Well, come down off your high horse, mister. There ain't no use acting. This is murder, replied the sheriff softly. Quick anger sparked in North's dark eyes. I realize that, sheriff, he replied tartly, but Jeff, what he does off duty is none of my business. Pat smiled, sat down and pulled a sack of Macon's from his pocket of his loose hanging vest and leisurely rolled a smoke. Norris was plainly a high-spirited horse who would not take the spur. I get you, Bill, he replied soothingly, but you got the wrong angle. I want to clear your partner, not convict him. Now just cool off and rest your legs and give me the lowdown. You know the hairpin better than any man around here. North tamped tobacco into a stubby briar and squatted on a seat, applied a match to the bowl and frowned in indecision. For a minute or so he puffed vigorously and then... What do you want to know? he asked gruffly. All that you know about this Jeff Jasper. The young ex-engineer slowly dribbled smoke through his nose. Well, in the first place, Jeff doesn't need money that bad. His, his father is director of the road, rolling and filthy looker. Jeff's a good fella, as easy going as they come, but with no more backbone when it comes to booze and gambling than a jellyfish. His family shipped him west because he drank like a fish. Now don't be getting me wrong, Sheriff. North pointed his pipe stem at the lounging Pat. Jeff's, he's not vicious. The fellow's as harmless as a puppy. He's just weak and he's a, a sucker for a skirt. I ain't seen him around the faro tables at the bucket of blood. The other smiled. Probably he haunts them. Silky Shelby holds a flock of his IOUs. That wolf knows Papa will pay if necessary. And last night, prompted Pat, the wooden steps that led up to the car door creaked behind him. Jeff's clear-cut features eased in manifest relief. Here's Jeff, thank goodness. Question him yourself. Pat turned to watch the approach of a flabby-featured young fellow. Like Norris said, week right through, decided the sheriff, noting the pouched folds of flesh beneath the newcomer's blurry eyes, his wide mouth and a smudged mustache, eyes as soft and melting as a rabbit's. Jeffrey Glencorft, his tan shirt was wrinkled, and his high boots crusted with dust. The aroma of stale whiskey hung around his person. A gun was holstered, in a black leather holster on his side. Meet the sheriff, Jeff, drawled the north. The newcomer blinked and focused his eyes on Pat's tall figure in quick surprise, and then, as hastily, averted his gaze. He nodded abruptly and stepped into the car. What a night, he yawned, and now it's payday. Ye gods, is there no rest for the wicked? He swung round towards north. Say, Bill, you invite your guests rather early, don't you? 
The sheriff was waiting for you, replied Nor shortly. Glencourt wheeled like a startled colt. Me? Just checking on your whereabouts last night, said Pat casually. And what business is that of yours? There was a note of irritability in Glencourt's voice. Wisner was cut down and the payroll was lifted. Pat rolled out sharply. I'm checking up on people. Mark Wisner's dead. Glencourt's mouth gaped. His eyes wavered before the sheriff's direct gaze. Surely you don't be suspecting me. I suspect everyone till I jug the killer. Now just where and when did you hit the hay last night? Oh, returned Glencourt vaguely, fondling his soft, whiskery stub chin. I was playing a little poker in a block of blood saloon. All night? Uh, no, I retired around 3 a.m. Where'd you bunk down? With a, f with a friend. Give me his name. Uh, say, Sheriff, pleaded Glencourt, flushing. I really, really can't. It, it was a lady. If your alibi can't be verified, you go into jail, produced Pat. Suspicion of murder. Glencourt wiggled indecisively and Norse stared out the door. At length, Glencourt muddled sulkily. Blondie. Is that one of the Rose girls? Yep. Let me see your iron. Glencourt gingerly tugged the weapon out of the holster and passed it to the sheriff. Pat gave it a quick once over. The dead slug had not been fired from that gun. He turned to the door with a curt nod. Through the ground windows of the telegraph office, Pat glimpsed the haired-looking operator hunching over his instrument. The sheriff pushed open the door and entered. A plain plank counter spanned the little shack. Behind it, the operator sat at a table, jammed against the rear wall. The instrument stammered away noisily, while Staten scrabbled rapidly on a pad. He clicked a stato acknowledgement, and then his head screwed around, and he squinted at Pat from beneath an eye shade. Grab the killer yet? He inquired. Not yet. Anything on your mind? Headquarters got Pinkerton on the trail, volunteered the other eagerly. He tore the top sheet off the pad. Run your eye over this. Pat stretched over the counter and fingered the flimsy piece of paper and quickly he read. G. McAllister, Chief Engineer, Dutch Springs. Have instructed Pinkertons to investigate Weisner death and payroll robbery. Their operator Pierce now at Indian Creek. Proceeding to Dutch Springs immediately. Should arrive noon. Afford him full faculties, also enlist aid of local sheriff. Will duplicate payroll. Walsh, superintendent. Pat tossed the sheet back. Feller, you were relieved at midnight around? Ted Stallman? The operator fished a fat timepiece out of his vest pocket and slipped off its leather fob. He's due for day shift right about now. Boots crunched on the sand outside. Here he is. Ted's as regular as the sun. A soldiery feller with rowdy cheeks and square shoulders kicked open the door and slammed a lunchbox on the planked counter table. His quick eyes flashed to Pat's star and he grinned. You know why I'm hanging around? inquired the sheriff with an answering smile. Well, I reckon it's probably Wisner. You hit it. See anyone sulking around the yard last night? Yep. 
replied the squarely built man without hesitation. Interest gleamed in Pat's gray eyes. Can you describe him? The operator's forehead furrowed. Well, sorta. Somewhere after eleven o'clock, a fat feller dodges around them empties on the side and yonder. He nodded across the tracks. I figured it was a drunk. The Jasper cupped a match in his hands and lit a cigar and gave me a sight of his map. It was fat and round. He paused. Note anything special? Like a scar or something? Prompted Pat. Nope, but boy, oh boy. He sure wore quite the sparkler on his finger. <laughs> Bigger than a headlight. Right hand? Salmon ran thick fingers through his gray hair. Well, let me see. He rolled the match in that hand, and yep, it'll be the right hand. Rolly pool high, thought Pat. A pal of silky Shelby's. Aloud, he said. Thanks, old timer. He turned again to Stanton. You keep copies of incoming messages? Oh, you bet, grunted the night operator. He grabbed a long spike and set it on a slab of wood. A thick pad of yellow sheets were skewered upon it. You want to look it over? Reckon you got the authority to. Pat nodded. Stanton dropped the duplicates on the counter and shrugged into his coat. The sheriff gave his attention to the messages. They had been spiked as received, time and date noted on the corner of each sheet. He slid off the previous day's flimsies and leafed them over. They appeared of no interest, official messages regarding work and supplies. Suddenly, Pat held his breath and carefully he reread a short, curt note. Joffrey Glencourt, Assistant Paymaster, Dutch Springs. Not another dollar to pay your gambling debts. Your mother and I, disgusted and deeply disappointed, Thomas Glencourt. So, Jeff Friend needed a little bit of cash, pondered the sheriff. Man, a dance girl is his only alibi for last night. He laid the flimsy to one side and continued to con through the duplicates. Again, his attention was arrested. With knitted brow, he digested another. William North, care of Paymaster Dutch Springs. Identity established. Changed name before proceeding to Chile. Full report follows by mail. Acme. Further search revealed nothing with any apparent bearing on the case. Pat rescured the flimsies. The two addressed to Glencourt and North he carefully folded and stowed into a pants pocket. See you later, he flung in Sam's direction. The operator, busy at his instrument, nodded absently. Deep in thought, the sheriff lagged over the ties towards town. During the years he had toted the sheriff's star, he had been called upon to solve more than a few murders. Always he had based his investigations on the axiom. Find the motive. Pat's theory, oft prudent in practice, was that once a motive was established, apprehensive of a killer quickly followed. In this case now, he pondered, Jeffrey Glencourt had a clear motive. Used to lavish spending deep in debt and source of cash cut off, he knew the payroll was guarded only by Wisner, and was acquainted with the paymaster's habits, was a basically a weak character. Logically, that made him suspect number one. But why had Roly Pulai moseyed around the pay car after dark? Pat knew Roly. Everyone knew Roly, a stock buyer and feed dealer. Pudgy, round as a barrel, with shrewd eyes buried in beads of fat. Roly circulated freely among everyone, from saloon keepers down to grimy-handed track layers. 
but the spot where the sheriff saw him most frequently was the bucket of blood. Funny how the trail always doubled back to LaRoe's outfit. Pat's questioning brain next turned to Bill North's telegram. Whose identity was established and why? Who and what was Acme? Plenty work ahead, he thought warily, checking on leads. Not much chance of getting the goods on the killer before Pinkerton man turned up. Main Street was clouded by a dark atmosphere of depression. News of the murder and payroll looted had spread over town like a prairie fire. Few were concerned with the murder. Killings was all too commonplace, but the payroll looting was an altogether different matter. Men gloomily gathered on the plank walks or drifted aimlessly up and down Main Street, scuffing up the dust, unresponsive for once to the yapping of barkers and the hurdy-gurdy music of the saloons. Pockets were empty, for there were few who had not spent their last dollar in anticipation of payday next day. Before Steele snaked into the valley, Pat thought, as he elbowed through the discontent groups and crowding saloon fronts like thirsty steers around a dried-out water hole, the Gold Eagle was always to stake a man to next payday. But the breed who ran the new crop of dives were like a flock of vultures. They'd pick his pockets and pick him out into the street. Pat stepped into the semi-darkness of the huge canvas-covered structure of the bucket of blood. A thin scattering of men were sprinkled down the long bar, nursing their drinks. Two bartenders listlessly polished glasses. chuck luck or faro and poker tables, they were deserted. A forlorn group of girls hung around the dance hall entrance in the rear. Laroe, hatchet-faced and sinister, moved restlessly around the vast emptiness like a brooding spirit. Pat scanned the spread of vacant tables. His eyes lit upon two men seated at a small table against the side wall, heads bent close together in close confab. He crunched across the sand floor. One of them was Rolly. Rolly's huge bulk overflowed the straight-back chair like a sack of jelly. His back was to the entrance, and he gave no sign that he was aware of the sheriff's approach. His companion, Silky Shelby, who bossed LaRoe's gambling tables, watched Pat draw near with blank eyes. Shelby's face was as still and expressionless as a plaster cast. His white hands, slender fingers interwoven, rested easily upon the table. He was neatly clad in sober black, with white shirt and string tie. Howdy, Sheriff. Shelby's low, soft voice was a little higher than a whisper. I hear some guy turned a trick down there in the yard last night. Yep, replied Pat shortly. He came to a stop, standing above the pair and stared down at Rolly. You hear anything? He asked the flat, fat man pointedly. Rolly's face crinkled into a thousand creases. It reminded the sheriff of a big white moon in which two shrewd eyes were deeply sunk into. Sure, sheriff, he chuckled. I hear everything. They all bring their troubles to good old Rolly. I kind of liked Mark Weisner, but... He spread his pudgy hands. We all gotta go sometime. Pat hooked up a chair with his foot and Jack knifed into it. You take much exercise, Rolly? He inquired casually. The fat man shook over with internal laugh and his triple chins and belly quivered in unison. Do I ever take much exercise? Sure, Sheriff, at the bar. Arm exercise a tilt in a bottle. Not lagging it around the yard? inquired Pat carelessly. Cold silence draped the trio. Silky sat like a graven image, cold eyes flickering from the sheriff's lean features to his companion's fleshy face. Rolly stiffened his 
where he glanced meeting Pat's accusing stare. And then he commenced to chuckling again, a chuckle that grew in volume until his entire body palpated. Well, can you tie that, Silky? he gasped. The law puts the finger on me for Wisner's killing. Me who'd never hurt a fly. Sure, Sheriff, I was down at the yard last night, hunting Simpson, the commissary boss. Heard he could use a bunch of steers. Couldn't locate the gink, though. Got all tangled up. There ain't a marked trail in the joint. Did you tote any iron? Again, Rolly's features creased. Me carrying iron. Hell's no, Sheriff. I make too good of a target. Pat abruptly switched to silent Shelby. From the corner of his eye, he observed LaRoe's lanky figure edging closer and closer along the wall, straining to overhear the talk at the table. Might as well sit in, LaRoe, he flung over his shoulder. Might strain a gut the way you are. Masked by his mechanical smile, the saloon keeper stepped forward briskly and pulled up a chair, eased in up the legs of his well-pressed pants and sat down. The sheriff was addressing Shelby. How deep's young Glencourt in the hole here? Almost imperceptibly, the sheriff raised his dark-clad shoulders. I don't discuss personal affairs, he purred. See here, mister, Pat's voice hardened. There ain't much law here in Dutch Springs, but I aim to rod what little there is. You come clean or take a trip down to the caboose. It's jam-packed with stinking drunks right now. He's in the hole eight thousand dollars, whispered Shelby. Thanks. The sheriff scraped back his chair and rose, followed by three pairs of questioning eyes. So long, gents. I'll be seeing you soon. End of chapter three.